Hello, good evening. My name is Rabbi Daniel Lehman. I'm the president here at Hebrew College, and I'm very pleased to be able to welcome you to this first in our very robust program of events and learning opportunities that we are launching tonight and have uh, continuing throughout the fall semester. We'll have another uh, set of programs in the spring, but I hope you've all picked up a brochure uh, for our programs this fall, which begins tonight, uh, and I'll be introducing Art Green in a minute. Um, in October, we have a very important and I think timely public conversation on how we actually conduct our communal discourse about Israel. And in light of the uh, events of this summer, um, there's a lot of concern about how we as a Jewish community conduct our public discourse on this very important uh, topic. And we have a wonderful set of uh, speakers and panelists, Jeremy Burton, the executive director of uh, the JCRC here in Boston, Rabbi Jonas Steinberg, the executive director of Harvard Hillel, and Rabbi Melissa Weintraub, who's the co-founder and director emeritus of Encounter and works nationally um, on these conversations, these difficult conversations uh, within the Jewish community. So that's on October the 6th, and we really want to encourage everybody to be here because it's going to be an opportunity for all of us as a community to enter into this dialogue um, on such an important topic. Later on in October, uh, one of our esteemed professors uh, who was recently a granted tenure here at Hebrew College, Jane Kanarek, professor of Talmud, will be talking about her new book, um, which discusses Torah narratives and the formation of Jewish law uh, in dialogue um, with uh, Rabbi Gordon Tucker, uh, who is um, an important thinker, uh, rabbi in Westchester County and, and professor at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Um, so that will be on October 28th. We encourage all of you to come. And then in November and December, we have a series of, um, of programs, including uh, a four-part series, which is going to begin this semester and continue into next semester, celebrating the 20th anniversary of MEA, our Signature Adult Education Program. And we're featuring some of our uh, most uh, esteemed and uh, renowned MEA faculty. So this semester, uh, in November and December, we have uh, Professor Mark Brettler from Brandeis speaking about his research into uh, the Book of Psalms. And we also have Professor Shia Cohen of Harvard University, uh, our Women and Gentiles pers Persons, Biblical and Rabbinic Perspectives. Um, later on in the month of December, we're going to be having a special celebration to open up our Interfaith Center, which has a new home on the Andover Newton Theological School campus. Um, and that's going to be happening with the, a very important speaker, Ibu Patel, uh, who's one of the leaders of the interfaith movement um, in this country. Uh, so that's on December the 9th. And then we're going to be culminating our semester program with an important uh, inauguration of our Martin Case Lecture Series, which focuses on uh, bringing leaders in creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship here to Hebrew College. And our first speaker is uh, the great um, novelist, Israeli novelist, David Grossman, David Grossman. Uh, so that's um, in December, on December 16th. So we have a wonderful series. We also have a number of ongoing classes, both here on the Hebrew College campus, as well as downtown. Uh, in the financial district and in the back bay and those are described here and we hope that you'll uh, participate in as many of those public events and ongoing classes uh, as you can uh, because we're here to serve you and deepen your engagement with Jewish learning and Jewish leadership. Uh, this evening we're starting off our uh, series of programs in a pre-high holiday mode uh, with uh, really the 
uh, most significant um, scholar, not only here at Hebrew College, but really internationally, um, on Jewish thought, Jewish theology, um, Hasidut, the study of Hasidic um, Jewish texts and ideas. Um, he is the founding dean and the current rector of the Hebrew College Rabbinical School, uh, Dr. Rabbi Arthur Green. He's also the Irving Brudnick Professor of Philosophy and Religion here at Hebrew College, and I'm just very pleased to be able to welcome Betty Brudnick, um, who has been an important leader, supporter uh, here at Hebrew College. She's a member of our Board of Trustees Emerita and a recipient of an honorary degree here at Hebrew College, and uh, it's due to her uh, generous support of Hebrew College um, that we're able to uh, have scholars of the quality of Art Green uh, teaching and um, leading really the education of the next generation of Jewish spiritual religious leadership in this country. We're very, very proud of the growth and development of our rabbinical school. Uh, we just last spring celebrated the 10th anniversary of the rabbinical school. We have 70 rabbinic alumni who are serving throughout the country um, in various places uh, throughout the world, including uh, in South America and in Israel. Um, and we're having a transformative impact on um, the next generation of uh, Jewish spirituality, uh, Jewish learning, and Jewish growth. This evening, Art is going to uh, share with us uh, some teachings from his new book. He'll, he'll be describing it. Um, but it's a book on the top 10 Jewish ideas, um, at least his take on that. And I am happy to say that as I read the top 10, and I'm curious to actually to know whether the order of those top 10 are, are, is significant, um, but I was actually um, surprised uh, by what made it onto the list and what didn't make it onto the list. Um, and uh, part of that surprise was feeling uh, such resonance uh, with the top 10 that Art chose. Um, tonight, obviously, we're going to be focusing um, on this pre-high holiday period. Um, but the book is available uh, for purchase, and we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to buy it. We also did a raffle through social media. And I'm very uh, pleased to announce the winner of that raffle for a free book, and that is Nancy Smith, a Hebrew College alum. <laughs> uh, so please uh, avail yourself of the opportunity to purchase the book. I do want to say, uh, before Art begins, that um, at Hebrew College we've been doing a number of Top 10 series. We did a few years ago, Top 10 Composers of Jewish Music. It was a lecture series uh, that's on video. And we've been doing an, a young adult education program, which is called ESSER 10, in which every year we choose a different, actually the, the committee chooses a different top 10 uh, Jewish themes. Um, and so Art's book really fits well into this um, new pattern at Hebrew College of trying to focus people on the top 10. And it is our uh, intention to be using the book as a part of a, a pilot in teaching on college campuses. Uh, or Rose, the director of our Center of Global Judaism, began a program last year of teaching uh, post-birthright um, students at Tufts University in partnership with the Tufts University Hillel. This year we're going back to Tufts, but we're also expanding to Clark University in Worcester, and this is with the support of um, CJP. And we are intending to use Art's book as the basis for reaching out uh, to college students who have uh, a new spark of interest in Judaism as a result of their experience in Israel. Um, and if the pilot goes well, our intention is to, to spread uh, the teaching that is contained in Art's book uh, throughout the country on college campuses and uh, through our network of educators and rabbis and cantors um, to various communities across the nation. So it's really the launch, not just of the book and this particular opportunity to study with art, uh, but this uh, national and even international uh, opportunity um, to learn from art's uh, deep 
Jewish wisdom. So without further ado, Professor Rabbi Arthur Green. Okay, I think I've got all the proper mics. Thank you, Danny. Thank you all for being here. We'll come to the book a little later. I'll talk to the book about the book uh, toward the end of the evening and come back to it. But I really want to devote the evening to preparation for Yamim Noraim. I think that's what we're here for. So let me, let me jump right into that. Um, we are, of course, more than halfway through Elul. Um, uh, the month of Elul is the month that leads up to, uh, up to Rosh Hashanah. Um, the Elul, the names of the months, of course, are, are, are strange. We don't really know what most of them mean. But the, um, the Talmud already says that Elul is Rashi Tevot, is, a, is an abbreviation for Anila Dodi Vidodi Li, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. My, my beloved is my beloved is mine, from the Song of Songs. Uh, one of the Hasidic masters comes along, the Svas Emes, and asks, well, why Anila Dodi Vidodi Li? The Song of Songs also says, Dodi Li Vani Lo. Uh, I am my, my beloved is mine and I am his, so maybe it should be Dalul instead of Elul. Why, why is it this way? And the answer is that uh, Elul is about uh, our approaching first. Anila do diva do dili, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine, means the action begins with us. Uh, we have verses that go both ways. We have a verse that says, Hashiveinu elecha Adonai v'nashuva. Return us to you and we will return. But then we have a verse that says, Shuvu elai v'ashuva alechem. Return to me and I will return to you. So who goes first in this dance? After you, my dear Alphonse, who goes, who goes first in this dance? In Elul, we have to go first. We have to make the first approach. And that's why it's anila do diva do dili. I am my beloved's first and then my beloved is mine. Um, sometimes we don't get a chance to go first. Um, in a few weeks we're going to have uh, such beautiful colors, the fall is going to come, and we're going to be overwhelmed by the power of the color, and then all we can do is respond. Then the event happens to us and we, and we respond to it. There's no, there's no initiation on our part, we're just, we're confronted with something, we're confronted with something that is hard not to call a divine gift or the presence of God or something, or something, something uh, transcendent. And then the question is, do we, do we notice it? How do we respond to it? If we don't respond spiritually in some way to the fall leaves, then we're kind of spiritual dunderheads of one sort or another. Um, the, um, I'm told by people who know, I know nothing about botany, you understand, but I'm told by people who know that there is no reason, no good botanical reason why the leaves have to turn such bright colors. They could, in fact, go from green to, to brown and dried up, and it wouldn't make any difference. So this is a pure act of chesed chinam. This is a pure gift to the human eye that we are given this, uh, this display of color. But even, not even going to the fall leaves, going to Rosh Hashanah itself. Soon, in a week, Rosh Hashanah will be upon us, and then also, there'll be no opportunity for Ani the Dodi. There'll be no opportunity for us to go first, because it comes, it hits us over the head. It hits us over the head with a kind of ematadin, with the power of the Day of Judgment, and then, again, we are in the position of responding, not initiating a, not initiating a moment of encounter, or a moment of relationship. Um, that, uh, that sense of what, the, of what Rosh Hashanah is, the power of Rosh Hashanah, I want to say a little bit about. This goes back to a conversation I had with my old friend Larry Kushner, who many of you remember. Oh, maybe, uh, maybe 20 years ago, we had a symposium in Philadelphia, and we invited Larry to be one of the speakers there. And we were talking about, he was talking about how Jewish life is involved with two great cycles. Jewish religious life is about the cycle of the year and the cycle of life. The cycle of the individual's life and the cycle of the Jewish year. He said the year cycle is in big trouble. Jews don't know what Shemini Atzeres is. You can't get a million in an unorthodox synagogue on the second day of Pesach. It's just very hard. Jews do not care as much as they might about the year cycle. A rabbi walks into a synagogue on Shabbos morning and he walks in, look, there are 400 people there. He says, wow, they're all here because it's Parsha Yitro and we're going to read the Ten Commandments. And then, no, no, they're all here for Jeremy's Bar Mitzvah. Uh, maybe 11 of them are here for Parsha Yitro. And that's, that's the way it is. And um, making peace with that or finding a way to move people from the year cycle. Because the year cycle, he said, is alive and well among Jews. Everybody wants to have some kind of Jewish birthing ceremony for their child, and bar and bar mitzvah, of course, are flourishing even among non-Jews these days. Um, Jews want rabbis to perform their marriages even when they're marrying non-Jews. Um, certainly when it comes to end of life, everybody, 
comes back to their Jewish roots somehow, and all kinds of other new ceremonies. You know, the, I celebrated the, the, uh, the um, 60th anniversary of my bar mitzvah, because somebody else in Armenian did, and then there'll be 50th anniversary of bar mitzvah, and various other occasions, retirement as a religious event, and so on. So all these things, all these things, the life cycle seems to be growing and flourishing among Jews. And the year cycle isn't. And then we said in this conversation, what about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? How come synagogues are full? That's part of the year cycle, isn't it? And the answer was, they came between the two of us, no, no, that's not year cycle, that's life cycle. People show up on Yom Kippur and say, thank God, another year, I'm still here, bye. <laughs> that's it, sort of, you know? I sort of, I, I realize, I realize I'm alive another year. I somehow need to note the fact that I made it. And maybe the people I love made it, or maybe not all the people I love made it. But it somehow has to do with the issue of mortality, and therefore it somehow has to do with the year cycle and not just the life cycle. The question is, of course, how do we rescue it? How do we take that openness to being around the high holidays and make it part of the year cycle again, bring it back? Because in the year cycle, it's got a very funny place. Uh, you know, the Torah never mentions Rosh Hashanah as Rosh Hashanah. The Torah can't because this is the first day of the seventh month in the Torah. On the first day of the seventh month, you can't have a new year. New year is supposed to be the beginning of the year. Chodesh Aviv, the spring, of course, is the new year in the old biblical calendar. It was probably in the Babylonian exile when we switched from a spring calendar to a fall calendar, and we, therefore we have this event which the Bible just says, the Torah just says is Yom Teruah a day of shouting, a day of, a, lot of, a day of a great noise. That's all they say about it. It doesn't tell us what it is or what, it, or what it's for. Perhaps it's a little bit buried. Perhaps it's a little bit intentionally buried because there were so many pagan associations with the Babylonian New Year Festival, the rebirth of Earth, the rebirth of the gods. There was a little bit of hesitation about it. And so it's there, but it's not, it's not quite called, it's not quite named for what it is. First day of the seventh month. But first day of the seventh month means something else. It means a choice was made for a fall new year rather than a spring new year. And a fall new year automatically is not about birth, but about rebirth. It's about renewal. It's almost as though in the Hebrew calendar, think of, think of the climate of Eretz Yisrael, you're investing in the rain, which is going to make the growth of next season possible. So it's a statement of faith somehow. We're, we're planning for the next season. It's sort of the way you go to fashion shows now and they have spring clothing, yes? Because the buyers are thinking about spring already. Um, it's that kind of, it's, 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 a season, it's a season ahead of itself. But it's also about, yes, we have lived for half a year now. The question is, what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with that life? What, what have we made of it? What will we make of it? Um, you know, the Kabbalists talk about two kinds of, two kinds of light in the world. There's Or Yashar and Or Choser. Or Yashar is the light that shines like sunlight comes to the earth. God sends light into the world. God gives light. It's the light we thank God for every morning in the, in the bracha before the Shema. Hami'ir la'ar. It's God who gives light to the world. Uh, but then there's also Or Choser. Or Choser is returning light or responding light. And that's the light we send forth. That's the light we emit and give back to God. That's the light we return. We, 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 we repay for the light we've been given. Um, so the spring, um, the spring is about Or Yashar, the fall is about Or Choser, and indeed, indeed the two sacred seasons of the Jewish calendar. I started teaching a course, we began the rabbinical school, called um, Theology of the Jewish Year. And as I was preparing it for the first time, I realized something I had never quite seen before. It's going to be very obvious to you once I say it, but it, took, it takes a while to notice it. The Jewish calendar is made up of two parallel sacred seasons. In the spring, it's very clearly defined. Begins with Pesach, ends with Shavuot. How long is it? 50 days. You count them, 51 days, because you start counting until Shavuot from the second day of Pesach. 51 days long, a sacred season. In the fall, you begin with Rosh Chodesh Elul and go through the end of Sukkot, Simchat Torah. It's a 53-day season, exactly parallel to one another. In both of them, there's a great event at the beginning, there's a period of wandering in between, and then there's a grand conclusion. At the end of the spring season, you receive the Torah. Then you can go forth into the next 
several months of, of profane year because you have the Torah, you've been given the Torah to go forth with. The holiday of Simchat Torah, which is a medieval invention, didn't exist in the Torah, doesn't exist in the Talmud, had to be invented because the fall sacred season also had an end with receiving the Torah, something to go forth with, something to live with and nourish you for the next several months in the cold winter of, of the secular year. So you have, a, you have a great event at the end. Now the spring season is about Or Yashar. It's about Or Yashar because they're divinely initiated events. God takes us out of Egypt. God gives us the Torah. We are the recipients of both of those events. The fall season again begins with us, Anila Dodi. The fall season is about what we do, what we give. It's about our turning to ourselves and opening ourselves up and being prepared, being prepared to give. So it's Or Choser, it's the returning light. It's that, which, it's that which we can give. Which is to say, this is a period of doing spiritual work on oneself. This is a period when we have to dig and find what we have inside us and what we have to bring forth and what we have to give. Uh, the Kotzka Rebbe, the famous Kotzka Rebbe in the 19th century was a kind of a critic of Hasidism from within. Somebody asked him what it means to be a Hasid. He answered in three words in Yiddish. He said, Arbet Nabzich. To work on yourself. To work on yourself. Uh, that there is spiritual work to be done and you have to set to it. Um, years and years ago, some of you have heard me say this before, I'm sure years and years ago, Kathy and I lived in Berkeley for a year, for a semester. I was a visiting professor there. And around the corner from us, as around most corners in Berkeley, there was a spiritual bookstore. And um, they had a great big sign in the front, great big letters It said, Scientology doesn't work. And beneath that, in slightly smaller letters, it said, I think it was integral yoga, doesn't work. And beneath that, going down in the pyramid, it said, Christianity doesn't work. And then so-and-so doesn't work, so-and-so doesn't work, and it got smaller and smaller. Pure. On the bottom, in great big letters again, it said, you work. <laughs> so that's what, that's what the Kotzka Rebbe meant, of course, you work. Uh, my, my, my late and dear and much lamented friend and mentor, Zalman Schachter, used to say that Judaism is a toolbox. It's a wonderful toolbox to do all kinds of interesting things with. But if you just walk around with your toolbox, say, look at my nice shiny toolbox, and don't open it, then it, you've missed the point. So having the toolbox, whoops. Having the toolbox is a good thing, but using the tools, doing the work, doing the work is what it's about. Now, what is that work? What do we mean by, what do we mean by that work? It's too easy to say, repent. Yes, you've done terrible things during there, you have to find them and you have to, you have to repent of your sins. That's the obvious face of things, appearance of too much of the liturgy. Um, but, uh, but it's actually something else. It's not finding out what's so bad about you, it's finding out what's so good about you. And that's the harder part of, that's the harder part of the job. Uh, when confronted with this season of year, uh, Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlav comes to mind. He has a wonderful teaching uh, called Azamra, singing to God, singing to God with that which is left in me. And what he says is the following. He says, you have to learn to, he starts with, very subtly, he starts with other people. He says, you have to judge people generously. You have to judge people lechav zechut. Lechav zechut means on the side of merit. Because when you see a person and you tell them what is wrong with them, they identify with that and it makes them worse. It pegs them into that side. But if you begin telling a person what's good about them, if you begin showing a person now, even though they think they may be not good at all, you find some little bit of good they have done, and you build up that little bit of good and tell them there must be some good in you, because look, you've done this and you've done this. Then they begin to identify with that side and you can actually move them from the place of, from the place of evil to the place of goodness. And he has a nice biblical verse, you will look at his place, and you will look at the sinner's place, he will no longer be there. The psalmist meant, of course, he'll be destroyed. But Rabbi Nachman meant he won't be in that place anymore because you have moved him, because you found the good in him. And then he makes a dramatic switch. He says, if you can do that for other people, you can do it for yourself as well. Because when we look at ourselves, we say, oh, I haven't done anything decent, I haven't done anything worthwhile. This year I certainly haven't done anything good. But then find, find, that, find that bit of good in yourself. Find, that, find the goodness. Find the sparks of goodness. 
And even if you say, well, yes, I did something good, but after all, it was for bad reasons. I wanted people to notice it, and I wanted to get paid, or I wanted, I wanted to feel better. Still, there's, even, though, even though you can find everything wrong with it, there is still some bit of goodness in it. You have to be in the business of collecting the kudot or collecting bits of goodness. And when you collect enough of those bits of goodness, then you move yourself from the place of judgment to the place of, to the place of compassion. And it is what we're looking for, of course. We're looking for that, for that place of compassion. I had a friend years ago who was a student of, of Eastern religion. And she said to me, you know, there are two kinds of gods in the Far East. There are dancing gods and there are sitting gods. Dancing gods, like some of those wonderful Indian deities with have all those extra arms and dancing around. So if you say, well, on the one hand or on the other hand, you know, there's still these four more hands to go. Those are dancing gods. Those gods are constantly in motion, constantly in movement. And, then, and, 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 and they're great because of their flexibility, because they can be everywhere and they can be, they can be moving constantly and changing constantly. And that's their, that's their beauty. And then she said, there are sitting gods, like great stone Buddhas of Japan, which is, and their power is that, mm, they're absolutely, absolutely seated there. They can't be there immobile. And that's their, that's their somehow eternity. That's their infinity. And she says, the Jewish God is, uh, is a seated God because he sits on Kisei Hadin, he sits on the throne of judgment. But then we, with all the prayers of Israel, lift him up and put him on Kisei Harachim. And we put him on the, on the throne of mercy. And we do that, of course, by moving ourselves from judgment to mercy, by learning to forgive ourselves, by learning to take ourselves from the place of judging ourselves too harshly, and a religious life that's too overburdened by guilt, to a place where we learn to forgive ourselves and learn to, learn to treat ourselves with a certain amount of mercy. Um, now, that sense, of course, that sense of treating yourself with mercy depends on a remarkable new Jewish idea. A remarkable idea that didn't always exist. It didn't exist, for example, in the Torah reading you just read this past Shabbos. And that idea is the idea of tshuva, the idea of repentance. You read some of the early prophets, you read Hosea, for example, prophet Hosea, and it's clear, Israel has sinned, and therefore beware, Israel is going to be punished. You read this chapter in Dvarim, even though it's, it's, it's got some mitigation. If you do not listen to my voice, if you do not do well, these are the things that are going to happen to you. It's kind of automatic. Sin and punishment are inexorably linked to one another. But we broke that connection by the idea of tshuva. Uh, and tshuva is, to a large extent, the, uh, the product of a very remarkable document we have, and that is the little book of Jonah. The book of Jonah is a book about tshuva. And of course it's a book about the moral education of the prophet. Jonah does not want to go to Nineveh. He does not want to go to Nineveh, not so much because he doesn't like the Ninevites, but because he doesn't trust God. He says, what's going to happen? I'm going to go, say, 40 days, the city will be destroyed. What are they going to do? They're all going to put on sackcloth and ashes, and they're going to fast, and they're going to go, ay, 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 shamnu. They're not going to, they're not going to change. People don't change. They're not going to change. And you, Rabbi Nishleilam, you are too soft-hearted. You are a sucker. You are going to see the sackcloth and see the ashes and feel terrible, and you're going to forgive them, and they're going to be the same people they were before. That's the prophet. That's what the prophet, that's why he doesn't want to go. And God says to him, no, you don't understand. You may not believe in them, but I believe in them. I created them. I know them better than you do. And they really can change. And so can you. And that's the good story at the end. So can you. We read that book of Yonah at the last minute, sort of the last Torah reading of Yom Kippur, in a very powerful way. Because we're being told, you may not believe you can change, but I do. I believe in you more than you believe in yourself. That's the message of Yom Kippur. I, I, God says, I, the Rav Nishalayim says, I believe you can change. I believe you are capable of it. And that it can be real change. And in the face of that, in the face of God's faith in us, it becomes hard for us not to believe in ourselves. That's the move that, that makes for the transformation. 
in, face, in the face of God's faith in us that we can change, we are called upon to let ourselves change, to be willing to trust ourselves enough to say, yes, you really are capable of change. Now that day, Yom Kippur, of course, is very thoroughly described in the Torah. Yom Kippur and Pesach are the two holidays the Torah really is concerned about describing in detail. Pesach is described as a holiday for all of Israel to celebrate, Kol Yisrael Yochloto. Um, Yom Kippur is really described mostly for the priest. It's a priestly holiday. The only thing we're told about Yom Kippur is V'initem et nafshotechem, V'initem. Well, it's a word, it's a word that we don't quite know the meaning of. It's usually translated afflict, afflict your souls, and then there are five kinds of affliction we engage in in Yom Kippur, including fasting. Um, but V'initem is really an intensive form of the, of the verb ana, to answer. So I like to translate it, make yourselves responsive. Make your souls responsive. Do the things that will make you respond because you're being called upon to respond. So inui is an intensive form of answering, of becoming, becoming responsive. But this event, Yom Kippur, is the one holiday in the calendar, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, but especially Yom Kippur, is a holiday that doesn't seem to commemorate anything. All the other holidays have been historicized in the course of the biblical rabbinic narrative. Pesach was a spring festival, but it became Yitziat Mitzrayim. Shavuot was a harvest festival, it became Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah. Yom Kippur, you have to dig a little deeper to find. Yom Kippur is the day of the giving of the second tablets. You remember Moses goes up on Shavuot, is there for 40 days, comes down, sees Yeshua made the golden calf, breaks the tablets, that's Shivas Har Betamuz. That's exactly 40 days after Shavuot, and that's why it's a, that's one of the reasons why it's considered a fast day. That was the day when, when the first covenant failed and the tablets were broken. Moses goes up again. Some people make it three trips up, but it's, it's essentially only two. Moses goes up again on the first day of Elul. He's there for 40 days and comes down again on Yom Kippur with the second tablets. What's the difference between the first and second tablets? The first tab of the first tablets, it says, the tablets were made by God, and God wrote on them. Valuchot ma'ase Elohim hema v'michtav michtav Elohim. God made and wrote the first tablets. When it comes time for the second tablets, God says to Moses, "Psal lechash ne luchot abarim karishanim." You make the tablets this time. I call it a renegotiated marriage. <laughs> it's the first time our marriage failed because I was dictating all the terms. I have learned now. I have learned. You make the tablets this time. God says to Moses, you make the tablets and I'll write on them. But then a few verses later, God tells Moses, you do the writing too. You do the writing too. You're, it's really, this is really going to have to come from your end. That same theme, Anida Dodi. It's going to have to come from your idea. If this marriage is going to work, if this relationship with God is going to work, it's going to have to work because you made it work. I can't, I can't force it upon you. I can't make it work. Only you can make it work. So it's a call. It's a call to compassion on ourselves. It's a call. Moses comes down. What, 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 what happens on Yom Kippur? What happens on Yom Kippur before Moses comes down with the second tablets? The great revelation happens. The great revelation where Moses is hidden in the cleft of the rock and, and a voice comes out and says, Adonai, Adonai, El Rachum V'chanun, Er Rachapayim, Rav Chesed V'emet. The voice comes out and, and calls God's name and says God is, God is filled with compassion and, uh, and forgives. Of course, of course, the rabbis did something very drastic and dramatic. When they took that verse of forgiveness on Yom Kippur, on the original Yom Kippur, and made it the refrain line for all penitential prayers all year long. During Elul, on fast days, anytime we have a penitential prayer, we recite the Hashem Hashem Kel Rachum V'chanum. We recite it over and over again as a refrain. And Yom Kippur night, traditionally I think it's six or seven times after each group of, group of uh, piyutim, Slichot, uh, you say it again. But, in the Torah text it says, 
God's name, compassionate, full of mercy, slow to anger, but surely he will not, and long suffering, but surely he will not cleanse the sins entirely. He visits the f- sins of the fathers on the children down to the third and fourth generation. And when the rabbis took that, they simply left that part out. Very dramatic. They took uh, a vinake. The last word we have in that synagogue version of it, vinake, is an intensive, and it means he surely will not cleanse. Vinake lo yinake. They simply took that word nake, cut it off from the other part, and said, you want us to take this? This is the part we want us. You want us, you want us to have a God who forgives? We'll make a God who forgives without, without the visiting the sons of the sins on the third and fourth generation, because each person dies for his own, as Ezekiel had already said. So they somehow they transform it. It's a very, it's a very, I would say, courageous act of Midrash. To take not only the biblical text that is born, but the biblical text, the text where, as it were, the divine voice itself speaks, and God says, This is who I am. And the rabbis say, You want to know who you are? We'll tell you who you are. And we're going to cut him up right here and say, You are you are a God of forgiveness. Uh, you know, we sometimes, we sometimes in Western culture are given a picture of the God of the Old Testament as the God of justice and vengeance, the God of the New Testament as the God of is the God of forgiveness and love of the heart. The truth is, this has to be the stages and history of religion. Religion as it emerged in the first, second century was becoming a religion based on love. That transformation was happening within Judaism. And what happens in the New Testament is a reflection of what's going on in Judaism at that time. When Rabbi Akiva says, that's the, the love your neighbor is yourself is the most basic rule of Torah. He and Jesus and Hillel in the generation before, Hillel who says, the whole Torah, remember to the convert, the whole Torah is about what you would not have done to you, don't do to your neighbor. All of that, all of that is happening at the same time. And you, you can see the transformation, the transformation of biblical religion as it's happening. So what is Rosh Hashanah? Time of the two thrones, time of arousing compassion, compassion toward ourselves, compassion for ourselves. At the same time, to celebrate the creation of member. The Tishrei Nivra Haolam, the world was created in Tishrei, according to, according to those who say this is Rosh Hashanah. We're celebrating the creation of the world. We're celebrating the creation of the world, but wait, is it the creation? Or are we celebrating six months after the creation? Is it birth or is it rebirth? It's the most universal festival we have. You look at the liturgy of Rosh Hashanah, especially the grand entry into the Rosh Hashanah liturgy. Um, uh, place your awe over all your creation. May every creature know that, that you are the one who created it. May every, everything made know that you are behind it. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful kind of universalist liturgy. And there's a sense there that uh, it belongs to the whole world. And at the same time, of course, it's the most private individual that is even belongs to you as, as a person. It's a challenge to you as an individual. Uh, the fall season is more individual because the spring season is national. Yes, the coming out of Egypt, giving of the Torah, are collective national events. The national element is almost missing in Russian Shemaniyah. You see in the liturgy, of course, we come before God as a people, but I would say it's mostly focused on the universe, on the whole world, and on the individual. The national side is somehow underplayed in the, in the, in, 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 in the themes of Yemen Yore. A prayer, therefore, is at the center of it. The word, the verbal, the verbal prayers at the center, rather than the ritual events. Though we have shofar, we have fasting, if you ask what's the most important religious act, I'm not just any people, it's Tfilah, it's prayer. You wouldn't say that about Pesach, you wouldn't say that about Shavuot, Sukkot, but you would say that about Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, the verbal, is really at the center of it. And that's why at Rosh Hashanah we undercut it. And we have that which transcends the verbal, we have the Shofar. The Shofar that says somehow we know words are inadequate. Or the Shofar that says somehow you have to go beyond language because with all this verbiage, with all the words we have, we somehow know that the words never never really fully express what we want to say. 
So I want to read you uh, something from another recent book, the last book I did, along with Bar, who's here, and, and Evan and Aria, we did this book, Speaking Torah, a year ago. This is a collection of our favorite Hasidic teachings for the year cycle, for the, for the Torah cycle, and the holiday cycle. I want to read you a parable, a version of a parable told by the great Hasidic master, the Magid of Hezrich. He told it before blowing the shofar. Maybe he told it every year before blowing the shofar, because we have six or seven different versions of this parable. And each time it comes out a little different. I'll read you my favorite, maybe combine them with it. I heard from the Magid of Tarabal, we offered the first shofar blowing. A king sent his beloved children to a far off country. They spent long years there, exiled from their father's table. But they were constantly concerned how to get back, how to dwell again in, the home, in their father's home in the royal court, how happy they'd been in sharing their father's joy, how far they went from, from how far they fell from him in his exiles. They began to send loving messages to their father, hoping he would take pity on them and bring them back. But once they got close enough to the royal court, they saw their father's countenance was not one of the most dead for them. They kept calling out and begging for his mercy. But there were no silence. After a long period of receiving no reply, the youth children began to wonder what they might do to reawaken their father's love. Why is it we call out and receive no answer? Surely our father has no lack of mercy, there must be something else. Then they realized that over the course of their years in this distant land, they'd forgotten how to speak the king's language. We became so mixed up with other nations, we took on their ways and started speaking their language. We have no way to communicate with the king. That's why our words are not heard in his palace. So they decided to stop calling out in words or language. They would just let out a simple cry to our house of mercy, since a cry without words can be heard and understood by anyone. Well, so that so that was his reading of that was his reading of Tikiya Shofa, what it means to blow the Shofa, um, to go beyond language. Of course, uh, if you, so you may remember Eric Fromm's book from a few decades ago called The Forgotten Language, that there is a, there is a language of the heart that somehow we forgot. This is not just about not knowing Hebrew or not knowing the liturgy. It's not just about the exile of the Jewish people. It's about the great exile, which is the exile, the exile from Eden, the universal exile. The exile that begins with our with our adult lives, with our separation into distinct individuals, with our, in the process of individuation, we pay the price of some alienation, we pay the price of being lost souls, of having wandered away, of no longer knowing who we are, and wanting to get back somehow to, to some ideal home, to some lost situation, to some lost wholeness that we're trying to recover. And we don't have quite the words for knowing what that is, or certainly the language for how to bring it about. So the shofar is a kind of moment, you could call it desperation or transcendence. It's a moment somehow that goes beyond language and just bursts out of course. It's like the Balsham Tov story of the boy with a whistle who makes all the prayers go up to heaven because they haven't been rising, they, they didn't have enough wings of love and all to raise them up and the whistle blowing sent them all to heaven. The shofar has that same kind of, has the same kind of power. It's, it's a statement about language that transcends language somehow. I like to believe that um, as we uh, as we have uncovered memory and subconscious memory, we have within us a memory of what it was like to be children before we had language, what it was like before we had words. I also like to think that somewhere in our DNA, since we now know that infinite numbers of generations are there stored in our DNA, uh, that the period before humanity had language altogether that our, our, our ancestors some 50,000 years ago, before language was developed, that, that memory is also there, somewhere in our DNA. We don't know really how to convert DNA into active memory. That would be an interesting trick. But, uh, but I think that, that that somehow is present in us too, that, that legacy. So the shofar is going back to that place before, before language worked, both in the individual and somehow in the collective of humanity. And, and saying that we are, we are we are dumbfounded by the ability to, 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 to restore the language, to, to know how to, how to get back. But the drawing of the short phrase is an attempt to return, an attempt to return to ourselves, an attempt to return to, uh, to be the human beings we want to be. And therefore, um, therefore, uh, rebirth. 
rebirth is really what the motif of the holiday is about, the motif of the season is about. But you can be born again. That's the message. It's the message we don't often hear in the Jewish language. But I think that's precisely what it's about. Uh, it's a celebration of the birth of the world, it's a celebration of the birth of the world in the season when we're picking up, picking up and looking for the next season and asking what can we carry on, what can we, what can we carry forward. And that means that the essential, the essential motif is that you are capable of rebirth. You are capable, uh, even in midlife, even wherever you are in the, in the course of life, uh, in, uh, in being, as the rabbis say, about, about uh, people who become Jews, to Tinochshin Oladam. You could become like a, like a newborn baby uh, with all the innocence and all the promise uh, that's still uh, that's, uh, there, and that's still uh, there in the person. So I thank you. I hope that's a little bit of a good help to setting you on your way. I lost it again, Karen. I think I'm going to have to put it on a different, different part of my anatomy. Let's, let's try a pocket. How is that for a dramatic move? Uh, before we take questions, I want to say a few words about the book. Um, the book is called Judaism's Ten Best Ideas, A Brief Guide for Seekers. Um, it began as, uh, as a kind of exercise to myself, to uh, some, you might say, my own values clarification exercise to see what I, what I would put on that list. Um, we then had a, 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 an oral presentation of it first, and then I began putting it together as a book. I do not want you to buy a copy of this book, my friends. I want you to buy five copies or ten copies. <laughs> this book is written, please, this book is written for you to give away. It's also reasonable enough for you to give away. If you buy five copies and spend $50, it'll be a good investment. This book is the book for your kid who's going off to college. This book is the book for your young person who says, why be, who's asking the why be Jewish question. This is a book for your daughter-in-law who's thinking about converting or your son-in-law. Um, this is a book for your neighbor who doesn't know anything about Judaism but is curious. Uh, it's, a kind of, it's meant as an, a door opener. Uh, it's meant as a first book somebody will read of Jewish interest. So if you have people like those in your life uh, for whom this book might be a good idea, uh, we just got uh, Jewish Lights just uh, emailed me two days ago. A rabbi in Rhode Island just bought 300 copies to give out to his whole congregation. So uh, I'm encouraging you to think about when you, when you look at it, think about um, not yourself. You don't, most of you who have come to an evening like this don't need this book for yourselves. But think about who are the people in your life who might need this book and get a few copies for them. Thank you. Now, time for some questions and conversation. Ken, how are you? Uh, Jess, how are you feeling? Um, I'll bring the mic to you if you have a question. Joe. I was struck by what you said about the courage that the rabbis had to cut it off and not care, you know. And also by Rosh Hashanah being more about the, you know, could, could be more about the good that we've done than the bad that we've done. But nevertheless, we say our text. Uh, I was talking to Joseph Tolushin about this one time, and he said, well, actually, I've written a prayer. It's about Al Zot, you know, Al uh -huh. But we, uh, today, the prayers that we'll need in this room in a week, will not have the courage to include that in our liturgy. We don't have that, or many congregations do not have that courage today. And maybe that's why some of the holidays are in trouble, because we don't have the courage to look at the liturgy a thousand, two thousand years later and, and, and reshape it. I wonder if, if you had an opinion about that, because there's something about it. The, um, there are lots of people who do. There are lots of very interesting things that have been happening in Jewish liturgy. In the, last, in the last several decades. Um, new reform prayer books, new reconstructionist prayer book, the new conservative prayer book does an awful lot. The new, uh, um, the name of the book, the new conservative machzor is? Lev Shalem, thank you. Lev Shalem, my dear friend Eddie Feld, has done a beautiful job in that book. And uh, yes, he has not changed the text very much, but then on, the, on the other side of the column and below the line, there's an awful lot of very interesting material that shifts the 
tone of the conversation, including some modern Israeli poetry, including some good, uh, some very good commentary. So I think there are attempts to do it. Now it's hard to do because the power of liturgy is in its familiarity. I remember a wonderful lecture I attended by someone we lost this summer, of the late Alan Grossman, who was a professor of poetry at Brandeis. Any of you Brandeis alumni will remember, alumni will remember Alan Grossman well. Uh, he gave us a lecture years and years ago about poetry and liturgy. And he talks about the difference between the poetry, the power of poetry is in its newness, in its freshness. The power of liturgy is in its antiquity, is in the sort of echo chamber of antiquity. I'm saying this the way all the generations have said it, and that's why it's powerful. When you change it, it loses some of that. So those are, you know, you, you, you put those, you weigh those against each other, and you come out somewhere in the middle. Uh, but don't, don't, don't sell short the willingness of some people to be, in, to, be, um, to be daring with liturgy. I think it is happening. The question is whether particular communities are interested in doing that or are willing to use those innovative liturgies. But there's a lot of good work being done. Please. Uh, I think I, okay, I called this fellow first. Yes, this end first and then the other side. Yeah. The prominence of the Avodah, the role of the Kohen Gadol. The, yes, the, the, thank you. The, the prominence of the, um, of the, how do you say the Avodah, the, um, the temple, the, the recitation of the temple service. In the middle of Yom Kippur, you recite the, the events that took place in the, in the ancient temple and the role of the high priest and why that's so important. Well, Yom Kippur was originally, a, as I say, was originally a priestly holiday. That's really, what, that's really where the Torah focuses the whole thing. And it's, it is an event of ritual cleansing. Uh, it's Yom Kippurim, by the way. In, in, in rabbinic text, it's always in the plural, Yom Kippurim. And, um, and it's because there are multiple cleansings. He cleanses the, the sanctuary, cleanses himself, he cleanses for the whole people. And, um, and it, is, it, is a ritual, it is a ritual event. Um, and I think that that... that, that character of it is still somehow there, even though we haven't had that event, all we do is recite it, and the recitation of it obviously isn't the same power that the original event had, that, that rit the ritual had to take place. The ritual event had to take place, and that included the, that included the scapegoat, the slaughter, the choosing of the two goats, the slaughter of the goat, and, uh, and that somehow it was, it was the power of the ritual that affected the cleansing. Um, Yom Kippur, as we have it now, somehow the, it's the words and the fasting and the atmosphere of the day that affects that cleansing, but it wants to maintain the same sort of dramatic power that was there in the priestly event. And so the recitation of the priestly event somehow becomes, becomes the core of it. You want to you catch that. You want to catch the power that it had. Uh, in general, so much of, so much of Judaism is about taking a power that once belonged to the priest and the temple and spreading it out, giving it, giving it to people. So Shulchan Domele Mizbeach, the table is like what the altar once was. Um, the idea of washing before meals, which is something the priest did before sacrifices, becomes something that everybody does. There was a kind of taking, taking, um, uh, taking uh, temple piety and making it universal, making it the piety of the whole Jewish people. You can see that, by the way, when you look at, again, how the Dead Sea Scrolls sects did it, and how the Christians did it, and how the rabbis did it. They were all working with that question of how you take sacrificial piety in a time when we no longer have sacrifices and make it available to ordinary people. Um, but Yom Kippur was really essentially a sacrificial event, and they did not want to lose that. So the recitation of it became, became a very powerful part of the liturgy, and, 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 and I think remains that. Um, and it becomes, it, it remains that partly because of the mysterious counting and the Baruch Shem Kavod and the, fall, and the people falling on their faces. That, that, that aspect, even though the priest isn't there doing what he did, falling on their faces in response to it, some of the response is still there. The response is preserved even though the event no longer happens, which is to say in some, in some imaginary way the event is still happening and you need it to happen. For the, for the day to have its full power. 
I think that's that's about what I understand of it. Exactly know what you mean. We're connecting those two events, the creation of the world and the rebirth of the individual soul. So I'm just wondering if there's ways of contemplating creation that help that process of giving birth to a renewed soul on the Is that any better? I'm not sure how many ways we need to contemplate creation. Creation is right there for us to contemplate it. Um, that is to say, to, uh, to look at the wonders of creation. We certainly have great psalms. You look at, you look at the Borch uh, Nafshi, um, uh, the great psalm, the 104th psalm that we say on Rosh Chodesh. Um, it's a magnificent, magnificent hymn to creation. Um, and so contemplating creation, it seems to me, is, is something that doesn't need a particular technique. Uh, but it's certainly, that's certainly what the theme of Rosh Hashanah is. It's the rebirth of the world and the, re it's the birth of the world and the rebirth of the self. And those are, those are connected by the day itself. The day itself creates that contemplation. So I would say use, use the day for that. Um, if the liturgy isn't working as it is, then, then, then leave the liturgy aside and turn it into that kind of contemplation. But it's certainly meant to be it's meant, to be that, it's meant to be that which stimulates such a divin. Cheshbon nefesh, the accounting of our souls that we do in this time of year, is certainly about precisely that, precisely that interfaith, the uh, interface, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the celebration of creation and the, and the transformation of the self. But a particular technique of such contemplation, nothing, nothing that I think of, if that's what you're asking. Yes. So I'm just wondering if there's a Jewish ritual or tradition that somehow is comparable to that feeling of taking off old ground stuff and seeing new green stuff. Well, well, Tashlich has some of that, doesn't it? Tashlich has some of sort of throwing the old away, throwing the throwing the sins of the old year away, and 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 therefore beginning new. That's a kind of that's a kind of preparation for rebirth ritual and going out to a body of water to do it. The, 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 water, the water is somehow going to carry it away and purify it. So I think that's a place where you have, where you have, where you have some of that. Does remembering have, does remembering have the charge of anger or not forgiving? Make it last. I don't think. I don't think the answer is by forgetting. I don't think we are charged. I don't think we are charged to forget. And we Jews have very long memories, and memory is important to us, and God's memory is important to us. And we, after all, have zichronot. We don't have shichachot on Rosh Hashanah. We have zichronot. We don't encourage God to forget. We 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 say we celebrate the fact that God remembers, uh, but that doesn't mean a, that's not a grudge-bearing memory. Um, that's not a grudge-bearing memory. That's a transformative. That's a transformative memory, in that it carries us to better places. We remember. We remember our whole past, and we carry it with us as we go forward. 
but it's not, it's, not, it's not meant to burden us, it's not meant to keep us down. The danger of too much memory, of course, is that it does that. You don't, you don't, you're, you're never able to let go. Um, but we do not, so we are not committed to letting go, to being free of our past, but rather taking our past and using it to, to, to construct the future. Um, so I would say that, uh, I would say that remembering, remembering remains a positive value, not something we want to let go of, um, but, but forgiving sometimes happens because we remember more rather than less. Uh, somehow because we remember more and know more and have a deeper level of awareness because we remember so much, which means we forgive somebody else because we remember our own faults, because we remember how much we've done, because we remember how much we too need to be forgiven. Uh, that when remembering is total, it seems to me that it has its own power of allowing us to cleanse and allowing us to let go. Um, when we remember, when we remember selectively, we remember what people did to us, but not what we did to others. When we remember our our hurts and not our and not our and not our accomplishments, then we uh, then we somehow are filtering out um, what might help us transform that memory. But I think a full sense of remembrance is a, is a remembrance that that so overwhelms us with 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 transcendence that we're going to be able to let something go. Yes, yes, remembering more rather than less. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is very helpful. Thank you. Quick question, uh, maybe. Um, <laughs> I'm curious about the connection between fasting and answers, um, which you said of uh, Inui uh, Nakash, mm -hmm. coming from that, that root of. I think it facilitates our responsiveness. That's the, what I mean by answers. It makes us able to answer the call. It seems to me that this season makes a demand on us, makes a call on us. That's what I meant about Anita Dodi now and not, not once Rosh Hashanah comes because then the, then the season comes to us, then we are called somehow for transformation. The call requires a response. And our ability to respond is really in some ways what this whole season is about. Um, and that and that sort of forcing yourself to respond, forcing yourself to be able to respond is what I meant by an intensive, an intensive inui as ana, an intensive you are, you are able to answer the call. Um, we have, uh, um, we have the example of, of uh, Shmuel, the call to Shmuel, I'm thinking of Tvilat Chana, of course, which comes on Rosh Hashanah, um, and then Shmuel is going to be born and says, Hineni, here I am. And that sense of, that, that, that sense of being, able to, being able to respond to that which, is, that which we are called upon to do. And called upon to do means, of course, to, 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 to know ourselves and to see ourselves fully. Um, and that, uh, and that's, what, uh, that's what the season is about. All right, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I want to go back uh, to the question of the order of the top of the top ten. And you may say that you did an intended order, but of course, when you write a list of ten, yes. it's got to be some sense of uh, prioritization. So what was curious to me was not that you started number one with simcha, with joy, and you explained actually in the book why you started with it. I think that's a very powerful component. But what was curious to me is number ten was echa, one. And in my years of learning with you and being with you, uh, diving with you and studying, the what? oneness seems to me to be very high up on the priority list. And it was curious to me that number three was halakha, the uh -huh. way, uh -huh. you know, the, 
the action. So I'm just curious. And you would have expected. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, the truth is, number ten was number ten was number one, and I switched it. <laughs> now, if you're a Kabbalist, you say one is ten, and ten is one. It's easy, but um, I didn't think people would be able to begin there. I thought they had to get there. They had to go through the other steps and get to the God language. I thought that would be the hard. That's the hardest thing for modern people. And so I, 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 at some point in the history of the book, uh, switched that from beginning to end. So that was intentional. Um, beginning with Simcha, I talked about, and, um, and uh, yes, I think, uh, I think there is no, I, I, I really do believe there is no religious life without halakha, without that sense of, without some sense of spiritual discipline. And uh, so it was, it was pretty natural for me to put that, to put that early in the list. Uh, number two was Selim Elohim. Um, and Selim Elohim in some ways could, only, could really be first for me because if I ask what has Judaism contributed to the world, what has Judaism given, what are the most important ideas in Judaism I want the world to know, I would say that every human being is the image of God is right there at the beginning, is almost, is almost the beginning of Jewish wisdom. Um, and it, I begin with that controversy between Rabbi Akiva and Ben Azai about what's the most important, uh, what's the most basic rule of Torah, is it to love your neighbors that every human being is the image of God. Um, had I not really had a desire for to put Simcha, to open it with that kind of, with that kind of invitational chapter, you might say I would have put that first. Um, so that's a little bit of reflection on that. Okay, let's call it a night and go buy multiple copies for whoever needs them. <laughs> and, uh, I think it's, it's close enough to say I wish you all a very good and sweet new year.